Is he on the mic? Yeah. Sorry, just saw that. <laughs> Okay. No, my Heidi, my Kota Katoa, Ki Tehui, Tenehui, of the Data and Information Meeting. Welcome. Welcome of everybody online. And welcome to Pim Bowen, our uh, Acting CE. Is that correct? Interim CE. Interim CE. Welcome to you, Pim. And we also have our Councillor Hilary Calvert online. And uh, this Pim. Up. and uh, our staff are online and our guests as well. We have somebody in public forum. Hello. Yeah. Nice oh, to see you. One person in public forum. Very nice to see you. And um, <coughs> so we'll start with apologies. Do we have apologies? Sorry. We've got there's nothing on this floor. Yeah. Councillor Deeker and Councillor Robertson, uh, apologies. Councillor Laws for lateness. Councillor Laws for lateness. Come all this way to be in his pitch. Okay, moved. Um, uh, Carmen seconded Andrew. Thank you. A public forum. Welcome to public, but uh, no public forum today. Uh, confirmation of the agenda. Can somebody? Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Carmen. Right with that. Carmen and Kate for confirmation. Uh, conflict of interest. Members are reminded of the need to stand aside from decision making when a conflict arises between their role. And actually, there is no decision making in this committee, so we're probably okay with that. Uh, the matters for consideration. Well, today is pretty interesting. Um, we have the, we're thinking about the head of the lake, Fakatipu, uh, which is really the Glenorchy area, uh, flooding and liquefaction. That's the focus of this meeting. Um, and of course, Glenorchy at the head of Lake Fakatipu is about an hour and a half from where we sit at the moment. Last Thursday, these two papers that are being presented today were presented to a local public meeting in Glenorchy. We felt it was right for them to have these first. Uh, they are the results of two investigations into natural hazards, specifically flooding and liquefaction. The reports were commissioned to develop an understanding of the natural hazards inherent in the landscape of this area and to inform adaptation planning. So today we present those reports publicly along with their peer reviews and a communications plan which help us through the next steps. So our guests today are Dr. Um, Shord Van Balagui, I think that's right, Shord Van Balagui, and he's a senior uh, gear technical, geotechnical engineer and a technical director at Tonkin and Taylor. Uh, Shord has been extensively involved with liquefaction investigations following the 2010 Seven, um, Christchurch and 2016 Kaikoura earthquakes, including roles map mapping the liquefaction and lateral spreading damage and its effects on residential buildings and services for the Earthquake Commission. And he's been part of the redeveloping the building strategy for the New Zealand government. So Short has co-authored and authored over 100 reviewed journal papers and conference proceedings on liquefaction, lateral spreading and ground improvement improvement. Suffice to say, he knows a bit about the subject. Sword led the um, project team who undertook the liquefaction of Glenorchy Township. Then we'll have a presentation from Matthew Gardner, who is an engineer specialising in the field of water resources engineering and is Managing Director of Land River Sea Consulting Limited. Matthew has been working in the field of water resources engineering, river modelling and floodplain management since early 2006. He's carried out detailed hydraulic modelling studies on, on, on a range of major river and floodplain systems in Canterbury, West Coast, Marlborough District and Wellington Wide Upper regions. Uh, he led the project team who undertook the flood hazards assessments for the Dart Reese floodplain. So that's who we're hearing from today, those two gentlemen. And to introduce the subject a little further, welcome to... Uh, Dr. Jean-Luc um, Payan, and also to Dr. Palmer over there as well. Kia ora. Thank you. And uh, hi, everyone. So I'm just going to spend five minutes introducing the, the topic. I take the paper as read, but um, I've got just two slides to put the, those two studies in context. Um, please, if you can put the presentation. And we can move to slide number two straight away. So about a year ago, we, we presented an update to uh, the better. Mm. Good, thank, thank you. you. So 
about a year ago, we presented a, an update to Council on the head of Lake Wakatipu adaptation work, natural hazard adaptation work. Um, can you go one slide? This one here. So what we have on the screen here is just a reminder of what we're trying to achieve with this program of work. Um, the key word here is resilience. Um, and that's in line with one of the community outcome we have in, in the ORC long-term plan. Uh, the current long-term plan is about building, building resilience from for communities against natural hazards. Um, the the approach is really to to um, look to the wider uh, area. So we're not only focusing on Glenoki. You'll hear a lot today about Glenoki, but the, the project or the program. Uh, area of interest is much wider than that. And you've got the map on the screen showing that it's basically the, the, the Dart and Reese floodplains. So that floodplain is very dynamic. Uh, you had presentation in the past about how the river system is changing. And that's basically a natural uh, process that is happening and con will continue to happen. This would be uh, uh, impacted by climate change, but the changes are happening and it's not, climate change is one driver, but it's not the only one. The other thing to note is the multiplicity of hazards. There are many natural hazards in the area that overlay. And the purpose of the program of work is to understand that environment, to understand the, the different hazards and how they interact together to be able to inform decision-making and adaptation. So we're taking a long-term view um, and a holistic hazard uh, adaptation approach. And you, you may remember, we are using uh, the Ministry for the Environment guidance uh, around adaptation. So Liz, if you can go to the next one, please. Thank you. Um, if you focus on the circle for the moment, that's uh, an illustration of, of that um, adaptation pathway approach. So it's based on 10 step uh, decision cycle. But the key thing I want you to focus on for the moment is those questions at, at the uh, edge of the, of the cycle, starting with what's happening at the top. Uh, so that's what we've spent the last year and a half uh, from that program of folk doing. It's really understanding what's happening uh, in terms of natural hazard, in terms of physical environment, what, it, what the physical environment is currently and what it's plan, uh, predicted to be in the future. Um, and we are moving into what matters most and really the next recent step is what can we do about that uh, those changes to, to really help um, decision making the other thing i want to focus on is that uh, red rectangle in the middle community engagement so that's really one characteristic of that approach is to put the community at the middle of um, the the program so as much as we can, everything we do, we try to share it with the community. We try to collect community's views on um, approaches, options, uh, and define that adaptation work together with, with the community and other partners. So engagement is it's at the center as illustrated by, by the slide here. Now, the two studies that you hear about today uh, are the one highlighted on that rectangle at, at the periphery. They're part of a wide set of studies that we've completed and you've got them on the screen that the outer text uh, around the circle. Um, what is specific? It's not the first time that we investigate liquefaction or flood hazard in, in Glenoki, but the specificity is for the liquefaction, it's really now looking at on the ground data um, underlying Glenoki. Previous study were mainly based on desktop analysis. And for the flood hazard study, the, 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 the novelty really is the fact that now we've got much more detail around flood hazard characteristics. So not only how far the flooding could go in different uh, scale events, but how deep the water could be, how fast. And when you combine them together, you've got a good understanding of, of the hazard related to flood. So is it safe for people to be there, for buildings, for vehicles? Uh, so you will hear more detail around those, those two studies now. Um, so I think now we can um, let Short maybe present.
That's over to you, Shord. Uh, you'll need to unmute and I'll, we'll get the screen up for you, I think, as well. Oh, you're doing it there. Okay. It's going to be easier for people to say that. Yeah. Great. I just uh, wasn't unable to unmute for a second. I'll share my screen now. Thank you. No worries. Okay. Hopefully... Um, not seeing is... that yet. No, it's not shared. Oh, it's shared. To the... Oh, there we go. That that's it now. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. Great. Well, good uh, good afternoon, every everyone. And my name is uh, Short Van Balagoy. And uh, right, so I'm going to be talking about the uh, lick faction study that we have done for the township of Glenorchy. It is the area that is um, circled in blue, uh, just on the focused on the township itself of Glenorchy. Lick faction is not a common. Um, hazard that we sort of see regularly on the news day to day, uh, sorry, like um, uh, like flooding that we're more familiar with. So just quickly go through what lick faction is and uh, how it occurs, uh, just so that we get some familiarity with what this hazard is, because it is less frequent in occurrence compared to flooding that you know. So I think it'd be helpful before we then sort of dive into the details of the study and what it found for Glenorchy. So how and when does lick faction occur? Well, we need three ingredients. Uh, we need the right soils. Uh, you know, predominantly the soils need to be sandy. We need um, the soils to be saturated. So need you know, uh, shallow groundwater. And then there needs to be a su sufficient level of ground shaking. And when we have those three things, uh, the, you know, the, the combinations uh, together, then we can get lick faction. Right, so what does lick faction look, uh, you know, what is lick faction then? So the diagram on the left-hand side, uh, the red dots show sand particles. Uh, this is, you know, as you might see them under the microscope, uh, a bit like apples in a box. And the blue in between is the water uh, for the sand that's below the groundwater surface. So before the earthquake, Loosely packed soils might sort of sands might look like this. During the earthquake shaking, everything shakes around, and after the earthquake, the soil particles, sand particles, can pack closer together, and obviously the uh, the blue in between, um, the, the the space for water reduces, and therefore water needs to squeeze out, and the ground surface subsides. Uh, you can do this with a bowl of sugar, um, you know, uh, fill a bowl up with sugar and then start tapping the side and you'll see uh, exactly the same process of that occurring, but obviously that'll be without the water. So what happens when this occurs? You know, on the left-hand side, we're showing the process. On the right-hand side, we're showing what then some of the outcomes are as a result of when lick faction occurs. So the, the soil above the groundwater uh, level, it, it doesn't liquefy. We call that the non-liquefying crust. The soils below the groundwater, if they are loose enough and there's sufficient earthquake shaking strength, they can liquefy. Um, then immediately you know, after the earthquake, that layer that liquefies, densifies, groundwater squeezes out. Um, it comes to, you know, starts finding its way to the ground surface and it brings a lot of sand and water with it, and we get a lot of ground surface subsidence and sand boils. And then after the earthquake, um, the, the soil regains its strength. So the, the you know, black faction causes significant quantities of water and sediment to come out of the ground. A video is probably uh, useful. This is a video that was taken following the uh, Christchurch earth, uh, earthquake 
And this is what happened for the two hours following the earthquake shaking. So this is not during the earthquake shaking, this is what happens after the earthquake shaking. So you can see all up and down the road, uh, water is starting to come out of the ground, lots of sand coming out of the ground. And after two hours, there was a, you know, a, a foot of water and sand covering the roadways and there'd been a lot of ground surface subsidence causing a lot of damage to the built environment. Right, so in a picture then, what are some of the consequences of look faction? Uh, the diagram at the top shows what, you know, what the built environment might look like before an earthquake. And then uh, the diagram at the bottom is what some of the consequences are uh, following an earthquake where look faction occurs. So the first consequence of look faction is differential settlement of the ground surface. So the ground surface uh, you know, subsides, goes down as a result of liquefaction, but it doesn't do so evenly. And it's that uneven ground surface subsidence that causes vast amounts of damage to the built environment. So I'll just take you through a couple of pictures. You see the house um, as uh, you know, due to uneven ground surface subsidence, the house is tilted in one direction, the garage is tilted in another direction. And obviously that's, um, you know, causes a lot of damage to the house and, uh, you know, it severely affects its amenity. Another consequence of liquefaction is that heavy objects sink into the ground. Uh, heavy objects might include power poles, uh, you know, electrical uh, transformers, heavy buildings, um, cars. And so here's a couple of photos of, yeah, when, when the ground liquefies, it loses its strength uh, temporarily while, while this liquefaction process is taking place. And here's a picture of a um, car that's just sunk into the ground. Here's a picture of a power pole that's sunk into the ground. Uh, examples of buildings that just sink into the ground. And this is a photo from the Nagata earthquake for EF, uh, in Japan. Uh, for particularly heavy structures or buildings, uh, the ground can completely give way. These buildings didn't topple over because of earthquake shaking. Uh, these buildings actually started to um, sink into the ground and rotate over because the loss of strength from the ground as a result of liquefaction. A, uh, the, the converse happens with light objects. So light objects float such as underground pump stations, manholes, uh, you know, chambers, fuel tanks, uh, they all start to pop out of the ground. And you can see on the top left hand is a photo of a pump station following the Christchurch earthquake. And it was uh, you know, popping out of the ground, all the electrical connections, pipe connections severed. And so while this pump station uh, received a lot of damage, uh, the areas in Christchurch that hadn't experienced damage from liquefaction, uh, also had their networks rendered inoperable because um, you know, the pump stations were unable to deliver water, not only to the damaged parts, but also to the undamaged parts of Christchurch. So there is overall network considerations. Manholes popped out of the ground everywhere. And what happens is when manholes pop out of the ground, they're connect the, the pipes that connect to them sether, uh, you know, break when they pop out and all the liquefied material is able to fill into the pipes and runs into the pipes, completely blocking them for hundreds of meters, causing extensive damage. Right, near a free face that might be a river or might be a lake where the, you know, where the ground uh, steeply drops off. Uh, then when the ground liquefies, it, the ground can move. It's a bit like a slope stability failure, but you know, it's, it's a very shallow angle and it extends far back because you know, when the ground liquefies, it, it, it really loses a lot of strength. Um, you know, there's hardly any strength left. And so you can get a lot of stretching and cracking as 
as the ground moves towards the you know, lake edge or the river edge. And so buildings in this zone um, and, you know, and underground pipes and cables and roads, they're all pulled apart. And here's some examples of um, cracking. Now, fortunately, this cracking is, you know, occurred within the garden in, in an area in Kaikoura and didn't extend back into sort of the, the houses. But, you know, it's larger earthquake shaking or worse ground conditions could have easily extended back to, to sort of beneath, you know, the residential structures, which would have caused significant damage to those structures. In Christchurch, they weren't so lucky following the Christchurch earthquake. And so we can see here the stretching that is happening on the ground, uh, pulling the buildings apart. Um, you know, you can see the movements that are occurring, the cracks in the ground as the um, land is moving towards the um, estuary. And yeah, another photo on the bottom left. One thing to note is that that isn't just getting pulled apart, but there is a vertical step there. Now, these houses managed to hold together, but if that lateral spreading had have been larger, um, you know, the, the structural form of those houses would not have been able to cope with additional deformations and, you know, there would have been collapses. We were very lucky in Christchurch that the residential buildings did not uh, collapse, and, and that's because the lateral spreading that occurred was of a sort of limited extent. Larger lateral spreads would have been a different story. Now, the top, right, uh, top left-hand photo um, shows a roadway next to the Avon River, and we see the lateral spreading that's occurring and the vertical drops. Uh, one would only need to imagine what the condition would be of the pipes uh, that run through this road carriageway, uh, main, you know, the main services running along this road. If this is what the ground surface looks like, you could imagine how damaged those pipes would be. I'd love to show you a photo of damaged pipes, but it is very difficult to because they're always buried. Right. Um, yeah, and obviously any bridges or infrastructure sort of crossing these three faces, uh, you, know, you know, when the ground is sort of stretching and cracking, bridges, for example, end up doing the opposite. They start buckling as the ground moves, you know, you know comes in towards the riverbanks. Now, finally, the last and, and an often overlooked component of a consequence of lick faction is the significant ground surface subsidence, and which can make you know um, flood prone areas more flood pro flood prone. You know, and this has been seen in Christchurch to sort of be in the order of half a meter to a meter in some of the worst areas, but where the lateral spreading gets particularly large, it could even be larger than that. And so just as a couple of examples, uh, here's the um, Waiau River that sort of comes out of Blenheim following the Kaikoura earthquake. This is not a river that's in flood. Uh, the, uh, the Kaikoura earthquake caused um, the ground to liquefy uh, beneath this uh, vineyard. And we see the, um, this, this area of the vineyard around the river bend where the lateral spreading has just started to sort of move sideways and a vertical drop. Now we can tell that it's dropped vertically because this farmer did not plant his vineyards underwater and this is not a river that's in flood. Uh, this, this is, you know, as a result of the earthquake and, you know, the, the measurements that we took that it sort of dropped one to one and a half meters, this sort of entire area. Now, unfortunate for the farmer, um, you know, about his um, grapevines, uh, but, it, it could have been worse. It, it could have been a, an area that would have been developed with residential houses. You know, and no amount of engineering on those houses to protect the houses from the effects of liquefaction and lateral spreading um, could, could protect it from the vertical drop. And so if, if, if the land drops, the house drops, and if the house drops and then sort of comes into a flood, flood zone, uh, then there are you know, cascading problems. Uh, here is a map of the uh, Christchurch, uh, you know, with the Avon River that goes through Christchurch, and just some cross sections that are showing of the um, of of the Avon River. And if we just sort of expand one of them, the grey line is the ground surface that you know what the ground surface used to be before the earthquakes. 
the river profile. And as a result of the earthquakes or after the, prof, uh, the earthquakes, we resurveyed with LIDAR survey, surveys the sort of Christchurch, and we saw that the ground level had considerably dropped. And um, that, that's now marked by the black line. And the green bits are the stop banks that needed to be built to keep the high tide or the spring tides out. So, you know, the, the, the low lying parts of Christchurch used to be above the spring tide levels, but as a result of the lick faction and lateral spreading, uh, the land has dropped. Stop banks had to be built to now keep the spring tides out because there's been a meter drop. Now, lick faction isn't just a, a phenomenon that occurs, uh, yeah, that occurred in Christchurch. And uh, you know, we, we saw it in Kaikoura following the Kaikoura earthquake. We saw it throughout Blenheim following the Kaikoura earthquake. We've you know, also mapped in, uh, you know, where it occurred following the 1987 Edgecombe earthquake in the Bay of Plenty. It's also been documented in other areas such as the West Coast towns of New Zealand. So you know, if we've got the right conditions, uh, this hazard can occur. So now, now that we've talked about the hazard, now we can sort of start talking about well, what, what's the study that we've done in Glen Orkey. So I've got the little um, diagram on the top right hand of the screen that I'll keep on sort of um, showing. Uh, we're first going to start by discussing the soil conditions. So on 10 to 16 October uh, 2021, last year, we did a bunch of geotechnical investigations throughout the township of Glen Orkey. Uh, we pushed cone penetration tests into the ground to depths of 20 meters, and that's pushing a steel rod on the ground to measure the resistance uh, you know, of, the, of the ground. Um, the harder it is to push the rod into the ground, uh, the denser the soil must be, the easier it is to push it in the ground, the looser the soil must be. So that gives a measure of the soil strength. We also drilled machine boreholes and got the borehole core out of the ground so that we could see what the soils were. And it, you know, those investigations revealed widespread sort of um, loose to medium dense uh, sand, sandy soils, uh, which then gives us the, the, you know, the, the, right, the, the right ingredients, unfortunately, for um, soils that are susceptible to liquefaction. We started to combine all of that information together and had a look at, well, how, you know, what's built up Glen Orkey, where has it come from? And so when we looked at all those investigation results that, and, and the geomorphology around the area, it became quite apparent that the uh, Glen Orkey Delta has been built from the sediment that's been coming out of the Buckler Burn. Uh, you know, many of thousands of years ago when the lake level was uh, much higher, uh, the, the um, Buckler Burn was uh, coming, you know, de depositing the material and this sort of finer sand was being deposited underwater forming this underwater delta and you know, material that's deposited in, in an underwater sort of delta uh, will be depositing in a very loose um, uh, loose uh, uh, deposition environment low energy so it's um, you know, the sand particles aren't being packed tightly together uh, which then makes it very susceptible to lick faction as the lake level levels dropped to sort of more present day levels, uh, the buckler burn has, you know, the finer sediments sort of washed out to sort of the, the, the lake, but the, you know, uh, during times of debris flows, we've got more coarser gravels uh, providing a sort of a crust of the blue material over the top. So it's, it's all come from the buckler burn. And it's only in more recent times that the Reese River has, um, the sediment build up from the Reese River has come to butt up against the delta formed by the Buckler Burn. So Glen Orkey sitting, uh, sitting on a delta formed by the Buckler Burn. We found that the ground conditions are very consistent throughout the area. Um, and that the subsurface soil layers comprise loose to medium dense sands to depths greater than 20 meters. Now, as a reference for comparison, uh, typically the worst affected areas in Christchurch from Lick Faction only had loose to medium dense sands to depths greater than it, to depths of 10 meters. So in the Glen Orkey area, the thickness of the susceptible materials to Lick Faction is double that which we've seen in Christchurch. Right, so 
now that we've talked about soil conditions, uh, sorry, soil conditions, we're ready to move on to talk about groundwater. We've used the available groundwater information. We know where the uh, lake levels are. We know where the um, lagoon levels are. And using groundwater well monitoring information, we sort of pulled that together and uh, basically found that the uh, groundwater was, uh, uh, surface was gradually increasing from the lake level up to the lagoon level with a rise of about uh, two meter rise over the, um, over the, over the distance between the lake to the, to the lagoon. We're then able to use the LIDAR surveys to subtract off the ground surface level from the uh, ground surface or groundwater elevation to produce a depth to groundwater map. Uh, the purple colors is where the depth to groundwater is deep, uh, which is on the southern side of the township, you know, butting up against the Bible Terrace. And the lighter colors is where the groundwater is very shallow. And um, so it, again, across Glen Aukey, we've got shallow groundwater. It's deeper in some parts, shallower in other parts. So we've got the second ingredient that's necessary for like faction. Uh, now, if we move on to the earthquake shaking, uh, the Glen Aukey sits within the sort of um, uh, Southern Alps. Uh, it's a high seismicity area, lots of active uh, faults in, in the region, and a particularly active fault is the Alpine fault that I just want to draw your attention to. So we have used the codes um, and, and guidelines to extract out the, what, what the different return period design levels of shaking are. Uh, there is some uncertainty there, so we have, have a range. Uh, further to that, those codes and guidelines are all in the, th in the sort of process of being updated. We're expecting from GNS a new seismic hazard model to become available. Generally, that, the, the, the seismic hazard is going up, so we're more likely to be at the upper end of the range. But the Alpine Fault itself is, a, is, um, is active. It, on average, uh, ruptures every 300 years. Uh, sometimes, you know, over the last um, you know, couple of thousand years, it has ruptured uh, you know, sooner. I think the sort of shortest rupture reoccurrence interval has been, or gap has been 150 years. Uh, the longest gap has been about 570 years. But on average, it, it, you know, there's a sort of big rupture on the Alpine Fault of, you know, on average, it's every 300 years. It last ruptured in 1717. So there's been 305 years elapsed since the last time that the Alpine Fault ruptured. So the chances of an Alpine Fault rupturing today are higher than they were 100 years ago because there's all of this extra elapsed time since the last time it's ruptured. So we've looked at an Alpine Fault scenario as well what the levels of shaking are likely to be at Glen Orkney from an Alpine fault rupture. And given, the, given that it's got a 75% probability of occurring in the next 50 years, that conditionally puts it at, at an equivalent level of an approximate 30 year return period. Now it's, it's not a 30 year return period, it does so every 300 years, but the reason it's, it's now a more frequent event is because, or, or is because it's last ruptured you know, 300 years ago. So it, it's, it's a sort of a, a building up or an accumulating uh, chance of happening. Right, so we've got the three ingredients. So now how do we assess you know, whether something will look fine or not? The graph on the left-hand side shows an example of one of the soil tests, the cone penetration tests that were pushed in the township of Glen Orkey. Uh, the vertical axis is depth below the ground surface. The horizontal axis is the um, resistance to, or, or the amount of pressure that needs to be applied to get pushed the steel rod into the ground. Uh, we could see that more pressure needs to, needed to be applied to the surface materials, and then it stepped back and then uh, didn't have a lot of resistance at all for the you know, following sort of down to 22 meters. We can then take those soil strengths and the design earthquake shaking, and we can then sort of assess using, um, uh, using the sort of tools available to engineers of whether liquefaction is likely to occur, which is shown in this middle graph. 
On the horizontal axis, we show soil strength. On the vertical axis, it's earth, earthquake strength. And the green area, if we plot in the green area, that's the, you know, when we don't expect liquefaction. So if we've got a soil strength and an earthquake strength that mean that we plot in the green area, then we're not expecting liquefaction for those soil layers. Uh, conversely, if we've got strong enough earthquake shaking and a low enough soil strength that we're plotting in the red area, those are the soil layers that we would expect to liquefy. And so the graph now on the right-hand side then shows at different return period levels of show, uh, uh, different earthquake return periods, um, showing sort of the results for the top 20 meters. Green are then the soil layers where we don't expect it to liquefy. And so we can see at sort of the more frequent return periods that we would not be expecting any liquefaction right through to you know, one in a thousand year levels of shaking. Uh, there's only a little bit of green in the near surface um, you know, of, of the soil layer, you know, a, a non-liquefying crust that we're not expecting to liquefy. And all the red is the, soil, you know, the, the depth of soils that we're expecting to liquefy. Uh, the results show a considerable thickness of soil is predicted to liquefy. We've, both, we've done the sensitivity testing with sort of a lower bound, looking at the lower levels of earthquake shaking with the upper levels of earthquake shaking. We've looked at sort of the Alpine fault and what it is likely to do. And basically the results show that liquefaction triggering is expected to occur uh, at 25 to 100 year return period levels of earthquake shaking. Uh, the upper 20 to 25 meters of soil is expected to lick Fife, most of the Glen Oki Township. And an alpine fault rupture event is also likely to trigger widespread liquefaction. The results that I showed before were for three typical um, investigation locations. And so here's just another way of showing that information uh, for an alpine fault um, rupture event. The, the dots represent everywhere where we've been doing uh, the, you know, where we did the investigations. Uh, the colored, the, the colors on the dots then show for an alpine fault uh, rupture event, the thickness of soils that are likely to liquefy. Now there is uncertainty, you know, at, at, at best, you know, the, the, the shaking levels might be low enough that we're not going to get um, liquefaction. You know, in a worst case, uh, the shaking levels are higher and uh, we'd get more extensive liquefaction, yeah, but the most likely sort of levels of shaking from an alpine fault event, we, we're sort of likely to get 10 to 15 and then, you know, the areas uh, to the north and, the, you know, Lakewood, you know, 15 to 20 meters thickness of liquefaction consistent throughout the township. So, okay, what, what does that then mean? What's the consequences if, you know, is, is there a difference between if we get one meter of soil that liquefies or 20 meters of soil that liquefies? And so to work out what the consequences are, we calculate a liquefaction severity number index. Uh, that is a number that, you know, an index that we're able to calculate to sort of then look at what, what the consequences of the liquefaction are. When we calculate a small liquefaction severity index number is zero to eight, that corresponds to none to minor liquefaction. So this is a property in Christchurch where there was some liquefaction of some layers lower down, um, but you know, it, it had limited you know, consequential effect at the ground surface. Uh, we also, you know, here's the, the bottom photo, some examples of um, you know, where a high liquefaction severity number was in, you know, calculated, which corresponds to quite a consequential you know, outcome from the lick faction that occurred. So we can take the lick faction triggering that all the different soil layers that, you know, where lick faction is predicted. We then sum those all together to turn that into an index. And then the index, uh, we've just got a scale here. So you get a sense of what, what low numbers mean. Low numbers mean inconsequential effects right through to larger numbers, 25 plus where the liquefaction then has high to severe consequences. So we've then taken the results of those investigations and the uh, geological models that we've been able to put together for how the area was formed and produce these consequence maps. Uh, and we can see that you know, the liquefaction is uh, you know, quite consequential. 
in the sort of northern and eastern, sorry, western sides of the Glenorchy Township and becomes less consequential, closer to, you know, to tucked up against the Bible Terrace. Uh, the reason for that is the, there's a thicker capping of, um, of denser soils over the top, gravelly soils. The groundwater is deeper. And that's why the uh, look faction severity or consequences are less there. Uh, whereas in the sort of part out towards the lake edge in the northern part of town, uh, the look faction severity is expected to be high because there's a thin capping layer, the groundwater is shallow, and it's uh, you know, much thicker layers of um, look faction that is predicted. Now, we've talked about the look faction so far, but you know, Glenorchy does sit on the lake edge and there is a considerable drop off. Bathymetric surveys have been undertaken, um, not part of this study, but we were able to use the results from um, survey, you know, information that OIC was able to provide. And we can see that there is a steep drop off of about a 25 meter drop off, about 50 meters into the lake. So the lake sort of bed just is, is shallow up to the brown line. And then from that brown or light brown line, from the light brown line, then there is a steep drop off to the dark brown line. And then there's sort of a gradual deepening of the lake after that. That 25 meter steep drop off is quite considerable. The drop off in Christchurch and, uh, you know, and, and, and Blenheim from the lateral spreading photos that I showed into the Avon River and the Wyal River was only four meters, uh, four to five meters. So a 25 meter drop off is five times greater. That means that the extent and the potential for lateral spread, you know, the severity and extent of the lateral spread in the Glen Oki area uh, you know, is, is likely to be much higher compared to what we've seen in Blenheim and Christchurch and the sort of worst affected areas of Christchurch. So we've used different methods to assess the lateral spreading. None of the models are, are perfect. So, you know, they've all got strengths and weaknesses. Uh, you know, trying to assess the uh, quantum of lateral spread is, um, is, is difficult. There's a lot of factors that go into it. But all the different models are generally showing uh, that, you know, the lateral spread is largest near the lake edge, you know, the amount of horizontal movement. And then the further we come back from the lake edge, you know, the lateral spreading, the amount that you know, the land moves towards the lake uh, you know, starts to reduce with distance back from the lake edge. Uh, but generally sort of near the lake edge, we're finding up to three to four meters of lateral spreading is predicted for an alpine fault rupture event. Uh, so that, that is the you know, severity of lateral spreading for an event that has a 75% probability of occurrence in the next 50 years. That level of lateral spreading is two times worse than the lateral spreading that was observed in the worst observed areas of Christchurch that subsequently became the Christchurch residential red zone. Right, so what we have done is we've taken the results from the lateral spreading and the look faction assessments, and we have then, based on the MFE or MB MFE 2017 guidelines, uh, classified the land based on the look faction vulnerabilities at the different return periods into zones that are considered very low, low, medium, and high yeah, for, of the look faction vulnerabilities. And then we further um, refined the high zone into areas with major lateral spread damage and severe lateral spread damage. So we've taken all of this information and developed a, a, a zone, a lick faction um, hazard zoning map. Before I show you that map, it's just really important to understand that the MB MFE guidelines were developed for the consideration of lick faction hazard for rezoning development of greenfield land. So for greenfield land guidance, the, you know, the guidance recommends uh, that areas with high lick faction vulnerability should either be avoided, i.e. don't, don't uh, turn them into sort of developed areas, keep them as greenfields, or otherwise, if they must be developed, uh, then there needs to be area-wide ground improvement or otherwise um, there needs to be conditions of that houses built on such areas or buildings would need very robust foundation systems to withstand the effects of high liquefaction vulnerability. 
in the areas with major lateral spread damage, um, the MB, MFE guidelines say avoid such areas unless the lateral spread hazard can be mitigated through ground improvement. In the case of Glenorchy, because the soils that liquefy are so deep and the lake drop off is so large, that's not really practical. Um, and in the, you know, the guidelines sort of say that the severe lateral spread damage areas should be completely avoided. I completely left as a green field. However, Glen Orkey is already an existing township and it's not a greenfield area. There isn't any guidance on what to do uh, with the different hazard zones for existing developed areas. So given that Glen Orkey is already a developed area, section 12.2.2 of the Canterbury Recovery Residential Guidance uh, yeah, pro provides some guidance for building or, you know, building you know, and design, designing for buildings for various levels of lateral spread damage vulnerability. Uh, for the major lateral spread damage zone, uh, you know, and, and there were some areas in Christchurch, uh, you know, that, that, were, that weren't red zoned, where engineers would need to design houses, uh, you know, where, you know, in, in major lateral spread zones, uh, the MB guidance provided some some solutions that could be used that engineers could use uh, to build, you know, safely build within those zones. Those typically those enhanced foundations to build safely build on those zones cost fifty to a hundred thousand dollars extra over and above the cost of a rent residential house on conventional foundations. Uh, no one needed to build houses in, or rebuild houses in the severe lateral spread damage zones in Christchurch, they were all red zoned. Um, but, you know, if, if, if one was to build in such a zone, more substantial engineering works would be required. You know, there aren't solutions available in the MB guidance, you know, they, they fall outside of scope of the guidance and would need specific engineering design. Um, yeah, and, and just to note there that within these zones, major ground surface subsidence in the order of meter can occur, you know, in, in these lateral spread zones. So even if you could engineer your way out of the problem by safely building within these zones, spending lots of money, you know, to, to build very robust foundations, they still wouldn't stop the, the vertical drop that occurs. So here then is the zoning map. Uh, the, the blue is where there's a sort of low liquefaction vulnerability following the uh, you know, MBMFE guideline criteria, the, you know, where foundation solutions are readily available. Uh, you've got, then got a bit of medium uh, is, you know, zonation of liquefaction vulnerability. A lot of the township sits on a high liquefaction vulnerability. And then at the lake edge, we've got the you know, major lateral spread damage area and the severe lateral spread damage area. I've just got some photos there just to, to keep in mind that uh, it's not just the lateral spread, but it's also the vertical drop that occurs with the cascading you know, issues of a low lying areas and what, what that would do to sort of subsequent sort of flood hazards and so. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions, people? I think we've probably seen this before, so we may not have it. Oh, Kevin Just and one, then Brian. Uh, one point of clarity. Um, further back on, your, you had um, the 16th and 50 and 84th shaping percentile. So what, what is that similar to when we talk magnitude? Is, or is that a different equation? So what sort of magnitude earthquake would you need to get for those levels of shaping? Okay, um, good, good question. So, you know, an alpine fault rupture is typically going to be of a magnitude 8, 8.2. Um, so it's, it's not an uncertainty in the magnitude of uh, the earthquake magnitude, which is really a measure of the energy release or the duration of earthquake shaking. The bigger the magnitude, the, the longer the duration of earthquake shaking. The uncertainty is what the levels of shaking, the intensity of shaking will be. Um, and so... If, if the Alpine Fault, for example, we, you know, one scenario is that it's sort of, you know, the, the rupture starts in the south and propagates north. 
uh, you know, we, we might be lucky and have lower, so it's still the same duration of shaking, but of a lower shaking intensity, and therefore we get less liquefaction triggered. Conversely, if the rupture started in the north and you know, propagated towards the south, it would push a lot more of that energy into the sort of southern area, would, you know, and, and that would be an example of an, an alpine fault shaking scenario, you know, rupture scenario that would cause higher levels of shaking. And so, you know, the, the, the same earthquake source and alpine fault, um, you know, repeated, you know, many different sort of simulations of it. Some, some, so some possible scenarios of alpine fault rupture would give you lower levels of shaking, some would give you higher levels of shaking. And so that's what those different percentiles, um, you know, rep represent as, you know, the most likely levels of shaking and then sort of your worst case scenarios and your better case scenarios. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brian and then Kate. Cool, uh, thank you. I mean, there's a lot of information to digest, significant hazards and uh, reasonably complicated mitigations. It, um, two questions, if, I, if just to get my understanding right, so, you know, the Christchurch, the first question, yeah, the Christchurch scenario red zones, is that likely to occur now in Glenorchy in the future? Um, well, th there is no guidelines, uh, you know, or, or any document that's, that sort of states when something should be red zoned or, or green zoned. Uh, the red zoning in Christchurch was done in response to the level of earthquake damage that occurred. The... Um, you know, the, the government stepped in and said it does not make sense to try and rebuild in some of these areas next to the Avon River, given how far the land had dropped, given how difficult it would be to try and rebuild on that land, how costly the foundation systems would be, uh, you know, how high the houses would need to be, the issues with the recession planes, you know, insurance, uh, you know, for, for a whole multitude of reasons. It just was not economically sensible you know, to, to try and engineer a way out of the problems of building in these major uh, or severe lateral spread damage zones. You know, it was just too, too many impracticalities to do it. That's why the government red zoned it. Um, but, you know, Glen Orkey hasn't had an event yet. You know, so, you know, there is no precedence of what should be done pre-event. Um, Post-event, well, that will then depend on what the levels of damage are and what's practical to do and not to do. Okay, I'm just getting my head around this. So my second question, yeah, so you're basically saying that the red zone process has got to be, well, to date, it's been a reactive process after an event as opposed to a proactive uh, planning design process prior to the event. Yes, yes. The red zoning that, that we're familiar with that occurred in Christchurch was a reactive um, process yeah. where it just did not make sense to rebuild in all of these areas, given the significant sort of um, reinsurance money that was going to flow into an area. And so that was just channeled into uh, re rebuilding into smarter areas. Well, maybe a follow-up question, but I mean, with Glenorchy, We've invested, we've got all the information. So why can't, what are the steps to make it a proactive process prior to an event? Uh, well, there is, there is no precedence. And this is where I probably need to turn to the planners because you know, I, I, uh, my role has been you know, an expertise is in, is, is in assessing the hazard and what the consequences are. You know, I can use the guidelines, but because uh, yeah, being proactive would then sort of, you know, that, that's a process that I think the council would you know, need to sort of work through. Thank you. Uh, Is there any other comment on that? Are you right? Well, I mean, that speaker sure. sort of sidestepped it. No, he hasn't. Well, he's, he's not being represented. It's not his question. He's no, just no, presenting no, a paper and the science of it. No, 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 I realise that. But, um, so my, my, I don't think he's answered my question. So I'm not, no, I'm not so sure with the answer. Do you want to try and um, ask that to somebody else? Yeah. Or, okay, so we'll leave that there. Brian, are you happy? No, um, I mean, is Dr. Palmer free to speak to him? Maybe. Are you Dr. Palmer? Would you like to make up some policy on spot, 
questions around process and yeah, yeah you're on. on that's okay we can hear you as dr payan said at the start we already have a process which is our broader adaptation pathways process yeah. Yeah. which is dealing with multiple hazards that was initiated through our understanding of flood hazard and large landscape scale change around aggradation and progradation and what this information means is it's one more hazard to be factored into that existing process that we have underway. Okay. In terms of the legislation, the policy settings, this is starting to get into uh, new territory in terms of preemptive uh, geotechnical risk. And whereas things around flood hazard, and there's plenty of precedent around that with CalSO and other kind of situations and clear legislative responsibilities, this is getting into, into new territory. Thank you. Thank okay, you. good. Cool. Thank you. Yes. Kia ora. Are we hearing from Matthew today as well? We or? are. Oh, so we've so we're running late. But, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I just thought. Yeah. Thought that made, Th made thank you. Um, yeah. Um, thank you. It's a wonderful report. Um, I'm not quite sure if this is a question for you or Dr. Palmer again. I'm sorry. I want to give the context. This is absolutely fascinating and interesting and great to have. What is the context in Otago and how many other sites? And just so that people know. We've done a lot of work in Glenorchy. What are we doing in other areas to understand the natural hazards? And why is it Glenorchy? I mean, you've sort of explained that we've picked what we're doing first. What, how, how does this relate to Kingston? Is that similar or different? Or is it tsunami that might be the biggest issue there? I don't know. And how are we prioritising our work plans to all of the hazards in Otago? I appreciate the earthquake work that's been done. Yep. Thanks, Dr. Pan. So, uh, the proposed regional policy statement sets out a framework for making uh, risk assessments for natural hazards, and that will enable us to take a very systematic approach across Otago to uh, identify um, the places and to get them into some sense of priority. How does Glenorchy compare to Henley or, or yep. Roxborough? Um, at the moment, the hazards team is scoping up what, how that would be applied, and we've made provision in the long-term plan over the next two years, I think it is, to start to apply that framework across Otago. So we've got much more systematic approach to places and hazards, and then, and then we can prioritise the responses to them. Thank you. A subsequent question. How is this paid for, this work, um, in the terms of the long-term plan and the value that it adds to Glenorchy, or otherwise, um, at, 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 um, in the rate system, is it general rates or a targeted rate? Um, Mr Donnelly's probably better to answer that question, but it's not a targeted rate on the Glenorchy community. It is broader than that. When we're at this investigation scale, uh, it is broader. It's not until we get to specific local interventions that we start to become more targeted. And that one more question then because of that answer. Mm -hmm. The interventions, is that our job or is it the QLDC? At what point does this become, you know, it's registered on their, um, on the limbs and it actually becomes an issue. Is it, does it remain with us or is it a joint issue with QLDC when, when we get to the intervention stage? Uh, this is a, uh, we have joint responsibilities. Okay. It's, it's something we, we are working on together this council is taking the lead on, on this one, uh, but we are working with QLDC and uh, the interventions will be some things that this council might choose to do and some things that the district council might choose to do and some things that the central government will need to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you. Is that, is that coming? Did you have a question? Or? Thanks, Jared. That was wonderful presentation and mm. really useful. Uh, we now move on to Matthew Gardner, who's going to talk to us about uh, the other problem we can face in Glenorchy, the other hazard, flooding. One of the other. <laughs> One of the other. <laughs> Welcome, Matthew. Over to you. All right, there we go. It wasn't allowing me to unmute. I think I had the same problem as, as short there. So I'll just share my screen. Make sure I get the right presentation up. 
So tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you for, for having me here to present to you. So I'm um, Matthew Gardner. I've already been introduced um, by Jean-Luc. Um, so I'm going to try and go through this quite quickly because I do realise that we're, we're over time and we probably have other commitments to get to. Um, so I'll go through and allow some time for questions if you want some further clarification. Um, so in a nutshell, um, we were commissioned to develop a, a computer hydraulic model of, of the Reese and Dart rivers. Now, the original scope was mainly focused on the Reese and the flood risk to Glenorchy Township itself. Um, but the scope, it was decided to include the Dart as it, the flooding mechanisms from the Dart does um, combine with the flooding from, from the Reese River and it, each river does have an impact on the other rivers. So, um, and we had good quality LIDAR data for, for both of the rivers. Um, and in terms of extent, the model starts at the, at the road bridges, which are cro crossing both the Reese and the Dart and goes downstream and, and encompasses the entire Glenorchy Township as well as Kinloch. Um, so in terms of the model setup, the model was based on the 2019 LiDAR. So just to point out, this is a fixed bed model. Um, so it's, it's not dynamically accounting for the effects of scour um, and grading bed levels. Um, however, these effects um, can be manually accounted for. So there's a modeler, I can adjust the terrains to see what would happen if, if we did have aggradation or, or some scour in this location. The main inputs into the model are flow, um, flow coming in at the bridges, as well as the downstream boundary level, which is in this case is the um, lake level for Lake Wakatu. Um, so both of those boundaries are dynamic. So we have a varying time varying hydrograph coming in um, and we also have a time varying um, lake level. So the lake is able to rise and fall. Um, and historically, it, it generally rises during a flood event. As the, as the rivers flow into the lake, the lake level starts to rise. So the flow inputs were developed by the hydrology team at Otago, Otago Regional Council. Um, just to point out, it is quite a complex um, hydrology in the area due to a lack of, um, of gauging information. So there's only a few gauges, and we don't have a flow gauge at all in the Reese River. Um, in the final outputs of the hydraulic model, which we've developed, uh, we, can, we can produce detailed maps of water level, um, flood depth, uh, speed or velocity of the water. Um, we can produce hazard maps, which is generally a relationship between um, the velocity and the depth of the water, as well as we can, we can output actually hundreds of different parameters, such as shear stress if desired. Um, so a lot of the information is available from the models if needed. Um, and just to highlight that every model is only a tool to help understand the real world. And we must always just keep that in mind. This is a dynamic natural system. The model is obviously a simplification of the real world. So we must always interpret um, our models in light of limitations. And there's just a wee saying that I really like. Um, every model is wrong. Some models are more wrong than others. So, so keep that in mind. Some people get, do get a bit blinded by science. Um, and as an engineer, I, I really just try and keep into mind the limitations of the tools. So they're tools to help us make decisions. Um, so the primary um, event which we've used for model calibration, um, well, we should probably be calling it validation in this, in this circumstance because we don't have a large number of surveyed water levels. Um, we have some anecdotal evidence from local residents as well as the fire staff, um, council staff, um, and, and a range of flood photos, but it's the information we have is more around flood extent. So what I'm showing you on the screen is a modelled simulation of the February 2020 flood event. Um, we, we know that it overtopped the Glenorchy Stop Bank and it flooded a number of properties um, in the area shown. Now, the red line is a line which we've created, created independently from the model and it's where we esti have estimated um, the final water extent got to. So that's based on, on discussions with local residents and looking at, at, at flood photos. Um, and so as we can see, the, the model gives a fairly good representation of the actual flood extent. Um, it appears to be slightly, slightly overestimating. However, that we would consider that to be within the, the expected bounds of uncertainty um, for the model. 
Um, and just to point out, it's primarily calibrated or validated based on observations in the Glenorchy area. So we haven't had those detailed observations provided um, for Kinloch. Well, we haven't spent the time looking into the detail, but that it's giving a reasonable representation of Kinloch, seeing it as it, it was it was working fairly well for, for Glenorchy. And I'll just quickly show you an animation. So this is a animation of the flood um, occur of the 2020 flood in the in the Glenorchy township area. So we can see those lagoons start filling up as more water comes in from the Reese River. Um, and then in time, we get so much water building up behind that stop bank that it overtops. Uh, we'll see that happen shortly. So the arrow, black arrows here are the direction of flow and a bigger arrow indicates faster water um, and the colors are related to depth. So red is the deepest and blue is the shallowest and green is in between. Um, so as you can see, it overtopped that stop bank and it rushes down mainly this area here and then just follows the natural gradient out to the lake. Um, and so here's just an example of the type of output which we have produced. There's a whole series of maps available in the report, um, which you can peruse at your own interest. Um, but this is just an example of the hazard categorization which we've used. This is based on um, the Australian rainfall runoff guidelines. Um, and these hazard categories have been developed based on actual real world flood data, um, primarily from the Queensland floods um, back in about 2008, I believe. Um, and so, so they've taken real world data based on depth as well as the velocity of water and they've correlated that to the damage which was observed and, and for example people being swept off their feet can children cross the water. So you'll see we've got a hazard categorization from one to six, one being generally safe for vehicles, people and buildings, there's some flooding but it's generally safe. Once we move into hazard category two, small vehicles, it would be dangerous for small vehicles to drive through that water. Um, and then H3, unsafe for vehicles, children and elderly, et cetera. Um, and here's just an example as to how that's derived. So you can see there on the X axis, we have velocity or speed and depth on, on, the, on the Y axis. So it's just a combination of, of the speed of the water as well as the flood depth. Um, so I'll move on. So one of the things which we've, we've done in the model is we've modeled, uh, we've modeled what we call an avulsion or a significant outbreak of the river. So that's where uh, the image which I'm showing you is a relative um, is a relative elevation DM. So the dark blue areas are showing areas of land which are relatively lower um, than the, the yellowy green colors. So we can see the Reese River um, is actually super, super elevated. So, so it's raised higher than the surrounding land. And it's a natural tendency for the water to want to take the least path of resistance and therefore it wants to flow towards those dark blue areas which is where it has been flowing already in recent flood events um, so it wants to flow towards that dark blue area and head towards the lagoons naturally um, and as the river continues to bring down sediment and a grade it's expected that will um, that it will likely do that in the future and that's based on 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 studies which have been carried out by experts such as Professor James Brassington from the University of Canterbury. Um, and so we've modeled the effects of an avulsion, what would happen if we had a significant volume of water um, divert from the current path into the lagoons. And so the map which I've got on the screen is a 100 year return period event um, for a future climate um, that's out to the end of the century. So it's quite significant flooding um, as you can see. But then what happens if we, on top of that, we have an avulsion. And so that second, um, second map I'm showing you there, so you should be able to see that's the, that's the map without an avulsion and that's the map with an avulsion. So you can just see we get an increase in flood depths. The, the legend for the flood depths is down here. Um, so you get an increase in depth as well as an increase in extent. And the direction of flow, just so you understand the mechanism, it overtops the stop bank over the entire length. But primarily a lot of the water comes down here comes out, fills up the slow lying land and it flows its way out to the lake. Uh, so as you can see, it's a number of residential properties uh, put at risk. Um, some of these have been built high on stilts, but some of them are actually quite low to the, low to the ground. Um, and just to highlight the reason why more areas of Glenorchy are not getting flooded, and it's that, that natural fan, as, as Short was pointing out from, from the sediment material coming out of the, of the buckler burn, um, so this area is actually quite well raised up um, and we just have a low-lying area here where the, the two fans are meeting 
um, the delta is meeting this natural fan. Um, and what's going on? So we've got this, the yellow shows the lower land and the purple, dark blue, purpley colors is, is the higher land. So the water comes in here and it just, it follows again, the path, the easiest path out to the lake. So basically it just follows those natural contours. Um, it would have to be a really, really big flood, bigger than we think could happen at the moment um, for it to be able to flood over the top of this, of the, of the highest part of that natural fan surface. So we've used the model to assess the sensitivity of roughness. Um, we've looked at water levels in the lagoon and we found that, yeah, it's not too sensitive to the water levels in the lagoon. The amount of water which comes out of the Reese River in a significant flood um, far exceeds the capacity of those lagoons. So they very quickly fill up in a large flood um, and, and the flood extent is not really changed um, for a large flood event it is. Um, and the main cause... Um, yeah, so basically the main cause of water is from di diversion of flows from upstream rather than lagoon capacity. Um, so one of the key findings of the model, which is probably really well known by many of you, is that we lose um, access to, to a lot of the roads. So, so there's a risk of quite significant inundation um, of, of all of the access roads um, and depths and velocities are sufficient that they would likely cause scour to the road surface. Um, and so, so there, there may be ongoing issues with access um, in the days following a flood event. Um, impact of the lake levels, we've also, we've modelled um, an event with a significant, like a hundred year flow event coming in from the river when the lake levels are at a relatively low level. And we've also done that um, in combination with like a 100 year lake level combined with a hundred year flow. Um, and here's the difference. So this is these are 100 year events with and without a high lake level. Um, so you can see at the top end around the lagoon, the extent doesn't really change much. The only impact, significant impact, is the lower areas um, close to the lake. And again, that's just simply because we've got that natural topographical constraint. The, the extent is confined by the topography um, and this lower area is where there's room to move. Um, and just to compare that, so what I've got on the screen, the yellow level is, um, is basically the ground level for a 1 in 100 year lake level event. So that's the extent of flooding which we would expect if we had a lake level um, flooding on its own. So you can see it's a very significant extent of flooding just from the lake. And then if we put a river flood on top of that, so the red which we can see is the increase in flood extent purely due to um, purely due to the river flooding. So down closer to the lake, we can actually see that the lake is what is, um, is determining the extent of the flooding. Um, impact of climate change, very similar to the impact of an evolution. We just get an increase in flow heading towards the lagoons. Um, so you can see we get an increase in depth as well as an increase in flood extent. Um, the number of properties flooded is only slightly greater, but the depths at each property would be expected to um, expected to increase. Um, and here's just an example of, of a hazard map. Um, so our hazard categories, you can see that dark blue is hazard category one and the light sort of bluey green color is hazard category two, which is unsafe for small vehicles. Um, and then the dark green is unsafe for vehicles, children and elderly. So we can just see that those sort of has a category two and has a category three as well as has a category four start extending over just a slightly larger area with some properties moving into those higher has a categories of the impacts of climate change. Um, and here's just an example of that over the, over the wider area. So you can see that there's just really no significant increase in extent due to the topography is already constraining the extent of the flooding, a slight increase, but the main impact is an increase in flood depth with climate change. Um, so in summary, we've got significant flooding, flood hazard for Glenorchy, but it is confined by the local topography. Uh, we know that the existing stop bank will not prevent flooding and will likely overtop in the future, as we've already seen in February 2020. We find that access roads um, are very likely to be cut off during a large flood event. Um, we find the lake level is dominates the flood extent. Um, for if there's a significant lake, like a hundred year lake level. Um, there is a known significant risk of avulsion um, and the modeling has shown that this will increase the flood extent um, and would cause the entire stop bank to be overwhelmed with a large, when combined with a large flow, um, we do get a slight increase in flood extent 
as well as depth in Glenorchy. Um, something I didn't show, but we did model the impact of a breach and we found that um, because the stop anchor is already getting significantly overtopped in a, in a even a medium size event, that a breach actually has very minimal impact on the extent of inundation um, as well as flood depth. However, the main impact is time of inundation. If the stop bank breached before it had overtopped, um, then obviously we get flooded slightly earlier than we would otherwise. Um, and to point out, the flood risk is not static. This modeling is based on the 2019 topography. However, the river is a grading. We have assessed some sensitivity to, to increased um, bed levels in the lower reaches. Um, and obviously the flood risk increases as the, as the bed levels increase. Um, and increased flows due to climate change are likely to increase the flood depths as well as the speed or velocity of the floodwaters. However, the extent is largely controlled by the existing topography. So that's everything I've, I've got to cover and happy to take questions. Thank you, Matthew, for your uh, in-depth, excuse the pun, um, presentation. Kate, first, anyone else? Um, thank you. Kate, um, again, brilliant presentation. Um, I suppose what came out of that for me is that um, the, while it, you gave some confidence um, about the height of the town now, if an earthquake happened, which we've just heard about, and that caused flooding from a dam that then um, went, as in, I think that happened in relatively recent times up there, a landslip that then opened breach and caused flooding. The fact that liquefaction may reduce the height of the township that you've just talked about at 416, I think you said, maybe down a metre or two, that could have a, quite a different effect. Um, if it was a cumulative event, both an earthquake that caused liquefaction and then um, a flood came through. And as we know from the Bible, as, as just a historical record, some things happen twice, uh, twice bad luck can strike twice at one place. So um, if we looked at both these reports together, there is actually a risk, a greater risk perhaps to the township if you had an earthquake first. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the question. It's a very good question and, and completely correct. So uh, modeling the cascading um, events wasn't part of the scope yeah. of, of the study, but uh, if we did have a significant earthquake, have liquefaction, the land level drops, then obviously we're, we're in a very different situation and, um, and, and flood risk could significantly increase. One other thing to keep in mind though is potentially the entire, we, we don't really know what's going to happen with the surrounding land, how much of the reefs may drop as well, or yeah. although I guess it is likely, Sean would probably highlight that, it is that fan surface um, of the township, which is probably most vulnerable. So, so I would expect an increased flood risk if there was um, future settlement. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Andrew. The recommendations and then just speak briefly, if that's okay. Yeah. Oh, so I've got a heap of questions on the paper. We've got, we've got none for the, this particular. So are they directed for um, Dr. Palmer? Probably more to Dr. Palmer, I think, just about all. Shall we put some of those first? Cool. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, Matthew. I think that's the end of the questions coming directly at you, but you might be interested in uh, Kevin's questions for our team. <laughs> Uh, yep, yep, probably the first one is um, that the Royal Commission says that regional and TA's uh, territorial authorities should ensure that they are adequately informed about the seismicity of their regional districts. Uh, it's got to be considered and understood at a regional level and that the regional council should take a lead role uh, and provide policy guidance on avoidance and mitigation. So what, what I'm trying to understand from the really good work we're doing here is what is our policy and how granular are we going to go before it becomes a TA issue? Because to me, that's a... Because at the moment, we're doing it as a general rate, so over, over the whole district. So in um, 2019, the alucofaction um, assessment for the region, and that's a desktop analysis, just to start to highlight areas where we may need to do further investigation or guide the, the District or City Council um, decision-making. So that's work was completed by GNS and being made available to uh, the general public through the uh, Otago uh, Regional Council Natural Hazard Database and to the District and City Councils. Um, 
probably add that the Royal Commission was looking, I think the Royal Commission was commenting on how you avoid a Christchurch situation yeah. in a Greenfield situation, rather than the situation we have most commonly in Otago, which is how do you remedy a Brownfield situation? And that is not really so much a policy planning issue, as you can see from this situation, it's more around physical interventions, and that's the real challenge. But, but will the level of that um, intervention not, not come from a policy that we'll have to develop once those areas are identified? So we've identified the areas within, uh, you know, within the TAs. So I'm just trying to gauge what other exploratory work do we actually have to do? Um, Anita Doyle yeah. would like to say something here. So Anita, thank you. Over to you. Oh, thank you. Sorry, just um, struggle getting the mics off today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, I was just going to address your question through the chair, Councillor Malcolm. The both the partially operative and the proposed RPS have a framework um, for once the technical work is done to start managing this uh, these issues, and obviously it differentiates between green fields and brown fields. Um, but there is a framework there once we've got the technical information to start, um, I suppose, implementing it. Um, and as uh, Dr. Palmer said earlier, uh, some of that will be uh, TA led and some will be regional council led and some will be a combination of, of us and or central government. So we do have the framework sitting in the RPS ready and waiting. Thanks, Anita. Uh, Kevin, is there something interesting? Um, Are we going on to another question? Oh, if someone else has a question, I'll have that on the page. Again. I think it's, it's you. Have you got something, Gary? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. We're just following on that, you know, I guess we're now in a situation of a, a new norm when it comes to data available and as we step mm -hmm. our way through. Uh, have you got a time frame around um, the interactions that will be held between a regional council and QLBC? Uh, and other affected parties, so that I'm um, just thinking of community possibly currently sitting there at the moment with a, a section they're thinking to develop or possibly in a consenting process already, having now learned this information. So through you, Madam Chair, we've already had those interactions with QLDC. Uh, relevant staff have been briefed on this. Uh, arrangements are being made to uh, brief their councillors later this month. And we were waiting for this committee meeting before we formally hand across this information for them to use as they see fit. In terms of the type of analysis that's been undertaken, it may not fully meet the requirements for an individual building consent, but nonetheless, it will still be helpful to them. Kevin, did you have more? Yeah, um, and on page three of our paper uh, number 138 financial considerations um, we've got and we see that it is allowed for in along the 2131 long-term plan uh, but it, it excludes staff time both those so I presume therefore invest, invested in work uh, from outside contractors so where is that staff time allocated and funded from and where is it accounted for? And is there a figure around it that's... So the, the comment about staff time is just to make sure the um, clarify the number, the, the budget is presented, the number is excluding staff time, but that doesn't mean that there is no time allocated for that project. Um, so we've got um, time put aside to continue working on um, the uh, adaptation approach I've mentioned at the start. Uh, in, in the long-term plan, and that's funded the same way uh, through general rates. Yeah, so you don't know the quantum of that? Uh, I, and I probably don't need to know, but uh, it's actually allocated, but we're not going to get another budget line coming to No, that. no, no, it's, it's yeah. Uh, ask more John, like, no, so, I, don't, yeah. I don't remember the exact number of hours, but we've got the allocation of, of time for, for that program of work. This might be Nick questions. Councillor Malcolm. No, no, I'm comfortable with that. Yep, okay. Yep, yep. Awesome. Any, anybody else with any questions for the paper? If not, Andrew Noon will move it. Yeah, happy, happy to move the recommendations and just speak briefly to it. Yeah, uh, and seconded by Kate. Okay. I think this is a, uh, I mean, this is core business for the Otago Regional Council for us to 
have a greater detail of natural hazards, uh, and in this case, focused on Glenorchy, in fact, the head of the lake. So it's it's far more than just just Glenorchy. However, probably that's where the, the greater stakes are. Um, it allows the um, the regional council. It, well, we clearly showed leadership in the in the space where we've got the greatest responsibility, but also we've got the greatest responsibility to ensure that uh, the wider community are informed. And through the working group that uh, has been established with Queenstown Lakes uh, and the um, the sharing of the information with Queenstown Lakes, that certainly um, delivers uh, to a key stakeholder in the in the district and also landowners within. Um, uh, the Glenorchy area have that ability to absorb this information as well. And you've got to um, accept there will be some concerned landowners and understandably concerned. However, they will be better informed. And I think that's that's really the key um, around this important work. And I suppose we should also acknowledge the uh, Tonkin Taylor and uh, Land River and Sea um, uh, consultants who have helped us to get to this point, plus the list of of information now that's available that's been built up over a number of years. It's um, the best condition um, the Otago Regional Council have been in to help inform uh, this community. So uh, well done, Paul. Thank you. Kate, did you want to say anything, Stephanie? Um, I, I think it's, um, I reiterate everything that um, Andrew said. I think the issue for me is that we need to be really careful how far we take this project alone um, when we have, I think, got a number of, and I need to go back to the 2019 report um, for GNS because I do think there's a whole lot of other areas like this. I think being in the science space is obviously a really exciting place to be because there's some really interesting um, studies to be done. But I'm, um, it's a heavy lift for us and an explanation of why rates are going up because this work is, being, is absolutely core. And we're, um, I think the journey that we need to take people on, I'd like to congratulate the staff for that and the leaders in that community, because when I attended up there in Glenorchy, the leadership shown by many of those people and the reality that they were facing was absolutely fantastic. And I'd like to congratulate them because they were asking the right questions and not becoming, um, they were looking at ways to work through it rather than denying it and pushing it back. So um, really good work up there. And I'd like to acknowledge that, but that's come from great work for the staff communicating with them at the right level. So um, it's, it's a, that, that, I agree, it's a really tough situation to be in, but there will be other places. And I think we can learn from this experience, but we also have to make sure that we're putting the resources into those other areas that I think we'll have. Um, and, and, and I look forward to that discussion about how we prioritize this other core work we all over Otago. And I think you're across that. Dr. Palmer, from what I've been hearing. So, um, yeah, and thank you for that. And the community is obviously, they showed up in a reasonably good number at the, uh, the meeting last week. So they uh, are across this information as well. And the, it was an online meeting. Um, so thank you for that. Put the motion on, have we got? Yeah, yeah. I, do, I just want to make a comment to it. Um, and, and I do support the motion. And look, um, Tonkin Taylor have got a catchphrase, it, it, exceptional. Uh, exceptional thinking together, uh, which I think really sums uh, the whole key of sorting these problems out. So I think that's really good. Sounds like our table, really, doesn't it? <laughs> but um, but one, one thing, I'll, yeah, just the key part to me is actually drawing that line where our involvement be, uh, gets handed to the TA, to the people. Um, you know, clearly we've got a our role and it is our core business, yeah. but we've got to be very mindful where we draw that line. So that will be the the part that I would sit, I just, yep, yeah, I just don't want to get carried away with the spending that we should be handing on and ensuring that that uh, we set that pretty good and it's encouraging here that it's in our RPS. But I'm, I'm happy and, and successful work done. Thank you. Shall I put that all in favour? Aye. Aye. Any against? Carried. Thank you very much. That concludes the uh, data and information committee meeting for June. And I, I suggest we, uh, we're running a bit 